on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Tonight, I'll tell you why the government has missed an opportunity to make the internet a safer place as the online safety bill becomes law. Sir Keir Starmer faces a rebellion in his party over Labour's stance on Israel. I'll be joined by one of the councillors who has quit the party and is calling for a ceasefire. And the BBC ties itself in knots over the conflict, with staff at the corporation reportedly crying in the toilets. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. It has taken years to get to this point, but yesterday the controversial online safety bill was passed into law. The government claims children and adults will now be safer online, but I partly disagree, and I'll tell you why. When I was appointed Secretary of State for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, the first piece of advice I was given was from Oliver Dowden, my predecessor and now Deputy Prime Minister. That advice was, kick the online safety bill into the long grass. In my previous post, I had served as a Minister for Mental Health and I was well aware of the impact online platforms and social media were having on young people. During the pandemic, the overall suicide rate in the UK, to the surprise of many critics, declined. But for many people under the age of 24, disturbingly, it rose. In my role as Minister for Mental Health, I chaired the National Suicide Prevention Committee. I spoke to coroners and the parents of those lost young lives. And I soon realised that unregulated internet access was becoming a killer of the young and something had to be done. Within a year, we put together a strong bill to place before Parliament and it was supported by MPs and voted partly through, just as Boris Johnson was removed. He was replaced by a Prime Minister who had lived in California and most likely will be straight back there once the general election is over. Rishi Sunak is enthralled to big tech and we have seen the results of that, a watered down online safety bill with true protection for young and vulnerable adults removed. Measures to ban viewing legal but harmful content have been dropped, meaning content that glorifies self-harm or eating disorders which is so vulnerable to teenagers, can still be accessed. They needed to pass legislation strong and agile enough to take on ever-changing changes and dangers that young people face online. But Westminster failed to grab the opportunity to make the internet as safe as it could be, and I believe this could be the most tragic consequence of the upheaval we have faced in government over the past four years. Joining me are broadcaster and writer Matthew Stadlin and Telegraph columnist Madeleine Grant. Guys, let's welcome and let's start with the online safety bill. So it's almost the case in this bill now, responsibility stops at the age of 18. It's like when you're the day before you're 18, you need the protections, the day you're after eight, older than 18, you don't. And there's almost an assumption that every adult has agency and every adult is able to make responsible decisions about how others can influence them online. And of course, we know that's not the case because they know there are very vulnerable young adults too. What are your respect? I'll go to you first, Madeline. What's, what's your opinion on the online safety bill? Well, I think that what it started out as, I very much support, you know, attempting to bring in protections for vulnerable youngsters and clamp down on truly dangerous content online. But I think it always ran the risk of making its aims a bit too diffuse, too generalised, to the point where, you know, it w became a kind of omnibus bill into which all sorts of things were, were piling and, and flooding. And I do think that often when there is any kind of censorship, let's call it censorship, it's you don't know what the unintended consequences of it might be, especially when you're giving, you know, big powers to, let's say, an organisation like Off Ofcom to kind of scrutinise and, and deal with the internet. And I was always a bit worried that, for instance, with um, the, um, the changes that I think were planned or have been made to encryption, there was a danger that if it became easier for something like Ofcom to scrutinise that or the government to scrutinise that, it would also be easier for hackers to get in. I think there were a lot of worries that I had about this legislation. I think it might have been better off sticking to its very specific aims that it began life with. Yeah, and, and, I, and I honestly, I, I totally appreciate what you're saying, and particularly around the protections of free speech and, and other issues. 
But there was a, and, and actually what we called it was a Christmas, a Christmas tree bill in the department. Everybody who came in to see me wanted to hang another bauble on it and add <laughs> something else into the bill. And it, and we literally called it the Christmas tree bill. And, <laughs> and you're right, there were so many people who saw this bill as a vehicle for their own particular campaigns and causes for the bill to address. But there, is, there was an important element in that bill, which was secondary powers of the Secretary of State, because the internet moves so fast, and these social online platforms, AI, you know, um, big tech, the ability to use AI and tech now to, to radicalise potential ter terrorists is on an industrial scale. It's something we didn't even, we weren't even discussing two years ago, and our Secretary of State is being discussed now. I think that it became too much of a Christmas tree bill, and actually, you know, some of those core, but amongst those core principles were the, the, uh, the, the legal but harmful. It was badly named. Mm. It should have just been the harmful. You know, young girls being, being enticed into eating disorder chat rooms, which, you know, has the highest mortality rate of any other mental health so There's this condition. distinction, isn't there, Nadine, between, as you say, legal and harmful, but it was within the government's remit to declare that harmful things, specifically the sorts of harmful things that you might have been concerned about and are still concerned about, could have become illegal, could have become mm. unlawful. So there's this, this, we're sort of playing around with language, I think, to some yeah. extent. This is a, a very traditional debate, isn't it, that we're now having in the context of our online lives. It's a, a debate between freedoms and protections. And it happens offline as well as online, as I say. So, for example, smoking, should people, people be protected from smoking and the harms? Or should they be able to be free to smoke but of if course they're we adults? Had that debate We've in 2007. had that debate in 2007. Yes, and we're having it again with Rishi Sunak effectively, gradually, incrementally out yeah. outlawing smoking. And treating we today's adults differently from previous generations of people who are adults. But, you oh, know, I was on, I was on the sorry, committee Matthew, I didn't that, mean to that, that, that... But uh, smoking is a really interesting one, actually. I was on the, um, the committee which passed that bill forward back to the House, and we spent hours, weeks in debates taking evidence there were weeks of discussions and debates over the original one. And I think the balance was just right. It was about protecting children and it was about public spaces and protecting people in public spaces. But to go that step further and to actually take the rights of adults to make their own choices about their own, own health. It's a very it's difficult just... area, isn't it? Because people such as ourselves, you know, we've grown up, we've become adults with the rise of the internet. You know, when I was at university, I'm not sure I even had an, an email address. And to regulate a part of our lives that so many of us have become used to not really being sufficiently regulated at all, mm. that's actually quite a brave and difficult jump for government, or at least a difficult step for government. It does have to be done responsibly and carefully, trying very, very seriously to get the, the balance right between those freedoms and protections. But I'm curious by something you said in your introduction, which sort of suggested that Rishi Sunak is in hock to, the, to, to big tech and that he'll, assuming that the Conservatives lose the next election, which probably most of us think they will, he'll go straight off to California and maybe even get a job in big tech. Do you really think that he's being that cynical? So uh, last week, I don't know if you saw, but we, we also, we had a sister bill to the online safety bill, which was part of that sister bill was establishing a digital marketing unit. And that had a number of responsibilities. So um, what many people don't realise is that um, that they, these big tech companies have amassed huge amounts of data and they're actually squeezing many of those who potentially want to come into that space out with their huge cache of, of data. We are playing catch up, aren't we? We're playing catch up in the media. Government is playing catch up as well because the explosion of social media, the explosion of social media in all sorts of ways, but perhaps most alarmingly as a trusted source of news when it is not regulated that is a really big question i think for democracies not just in this country mm -hmm. but beyond but i'm really curious to know whether you guys would continue to use whatsapp if whatsapp becomes accessible by regulatory so, bodies will it even exist in this country they may they question. may withdraw they it. may withdraw ditto signal i mean there's possible national security implications here um and you know just to go back to the point about the law of unintended consequences you might find also that with a really complicated regulatory and compliance regime, that smaller social media firms are now pushed out of the market because a no, big no, company it doesn't like apply Meta, to smaller, it doesn't apply to smaller organisations. Yeah. Only, only the big tech organisations. Do you think that um, that 
that young adults as a result of that, because I know you had free speech concerns, Madeline, or yeah. certainly the paper that you write for did. Do you think that the online safety bill now, as it is, is fit for purpose? Or do you think the the, the tech platforms and social media platforms have already run ahead? Do you think it's well, fit for purpose? To be honest, I think it is. It's, it's a problem that I think to some extent is intractable. You can't legislate against the, the hurt and harm that is caused by people using social media. Some of it will be general unpleasantness. I agree about the algorithms. There is a lot of dark stuff there. I worry that if parents are too blasé and they think that it's now absolutely safe for their kids to browse or whatever, then this may take the responsibility away from responsible adults to actually say, maybe you should spend less time on these platforms. Maybe you shouldn't have a smartphone when you're 13 or 14. You know, I didn't. I had a phone when I was at school, but it was the kind you could play Snake 2 on and call your mum, and that was it. And I think that was a very good system. It mm -hmm. didn't take over my brain. And I think my childhood, I do not... I feel very sorry for the current 15, 16-year-olds. Well, I had a Nokia for years. So let's move on to something else that's happening in Westminster. Crispin Blunt, um, innocent until proven guilty. I think in the case of Crispin Blunt, as you rightly said, I mean, there can be absolutely no assumption of guilt. Innocent yep. until proven exactly. guilty. He's been arrested. He hasn't been charged. As, as someone who spent a lot of time working in the media in the context of politics, but hasn't spent very much time on the parliamentary estate, I'd be really interested in both of your views on this so as, I must say as, as well, an MP. Well, Crispin Blunt denies the allegations completely. It, yes, he denies the allegations. But I'd be curious to know from your perspective as an MP and also from your perspective as a lobby journalist, as a, as a yeah. sketch writer, what's it actually like working on the parliamentary estate? Well, actually, I think my job is slightly different because my job is sort of to make fun of, of the whole thing. I try to keep my distance from MPs almost automatically. You don't want to be too matey because you might have to make fun of them <laughs> and you don't want to be compromised. But obviously, for most journalists, they have to talk to MPs a lot and sometimes... You know, MPs work very hard, long hours. So often the best time to talk to people is, is late in the day, you have a, a drink, you know, it's, it's very... Why are you taking, making the assumption that journalists are Lily White and it's MPs on the estate? Oh, I'm not, no, no, I'm that. not. That's why, that's why I'm asking Madeleine, what's it like as a journalist to work yeah. in the parliamentary oh, yeah. estate? Well, it is quite a dysfunctional place. You know, there's mm -hmm. lots of people that work very long hours, both journalists and MPs. It is their life. And sometimes they're a long way away from their families or they work so, so hard that they don't see them. I think it's, it's a very demanding job particularly for MPs. Yeah, but do you feel it's... threatened by a parliamentary culture? So I know MPs now, who I spoke to a couple of weeks ago, who told me that um, what they do now is they... So it used to be collegiate. MPs used to hang out together. You would be there sometimes into the early hours of the morning voting. There are too many bars. There's too many cheap, much cheap booze accessible. And MPs would, um, you know, bad things happened. But I spoke to some MPs just a few weeks ago who told me that they come in to vote and they leave straight away. They no longer stay on the parliamentary estate. They think it's unpleasant. It's. I've heard from many MPs that since, 20, since the pandemic, the atmosphere, since the 2019 election actually, that the, the whole atmosphere of Westminster has changed. And that with a new generation who've come in, there's just new types of behavior that we have a lot more young MPs, so a lot the whole more women vibes. As well. Yeah, and it's got worse. So it's, and I'm not saying it's the women, but it's got what the behaviour has become worse. I would say that um, in the past few years, you know, it's not a place I wanted to be anymore. Mm. It's, it's. I, I think it's been Th fascinating. That is a damning indictment, isn't it, of our parliamentary system, of the cradle of our democracy, that you as a woman didn't feel safe or at least didn't want to spend much time no, on the parliamentary estate. It wasn't collegiate. It wasn't a place to... So, you know, we used to meet after votes and meet between votes and people would, like, talk about what was going on the day. we talk like we are now, you know. We'd, we'd push ideas about and we'd debate ideas and we'd chat about stuff. It's smoking, Bill. You know, the number of conversations I had with, you know, we had over that, just going back to many years now. But that's what we do. That's not what it's like now. That level of intellectual conversation has disappeared. People don't talk about the issues of the day. They talk about plotting and gossip and, yeah. and it's all about, you know, and, and there's... There's far too much interaction between MPs and journalists. There's to, it's become quite sleazy and quite... And, you know, it's not going to be any better, better if Keir Starmer gets in. Because of the way Parliament operates now, it has changed. And I know people think, well, it will all stop when Keir Starmer gets in. It won't, because 
what's happened now is, as we were talking about a moment ago, the internet is now a big thing. Social media platforms. There are many MPs in Parliament now who look to the likes on their Twitter feed and their Facebook pages before they look to the purpose of what they're saying in the chamber that's in Westminster. True. And that's the big difference. They've got that little clip in mind, haven't they? I'm going to yeah. have to move on now, but this is a subject we could talk about a lot, I'm sure. Coming up, how much trouble is Keir Starmer facing over his stance on the Israel-Hamas conflict? I'll be talking to former Labour MP Dame Louise Alman, who quit the party under Jeremy Corbyn, and one of the Labour councillors who quit the party just last week over its handling of the situation, Russell Whiting. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive, well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who wins? Us. You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for this? You seem like, I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous What, do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis No, I am not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted new. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's that almost that like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. The first thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. The one thing Labour would be terrified of if Boris Johnson zoomed back into full focus. Boris Johnson uh, isn't what he was. Most of them seem to have given up. Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. He's as up. fit as a butcher's dog. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog? Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. No, I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know, now you're probably going to boot me off the show after saying this <laughs> girl. But <laughs> I say, I'm not, I'm not a Swifty. Critics, I'd say me included, <laughs> got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, yeah. <laughs> Great first show, you having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man, you know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you had? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. It was a fabulous dinner until <laughs> you two uh, mooned us. <laughs> Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Welcome back to Friday Night with Nadine. It had all been going well for Sir Keir Starmer, and when the news of the October the 7th Hamas attack emerged, he was initially praised for his response. Then he said this on LBC Radio. Israel must have that, does have that right to defend herself, um, and Hamas bears responsibility. A siege is appropriate, cutting off power, cutting off water, Sir Keir? Well, I think that Israel does have that right it is an ongoing situation um, obviously everything should be done within international law appearing to suggest israel had the right to withhold aid he later said his comments related to a different question more than 20 labor councillors quit in response hundreds of others are furious he hasn't called for a ceasefire and among them is sadiq khan joining me now is former labor mp dame louise alman 
Louise served as MP for Liverpool Riverside between 1997 and 2019 and is former chair of the Jewish Labour movement. She stepped down ahead of the 2019 general election because she said she couldn't risk Jeremy Corbyn becoming prime minister, calling him not fit to serve. She said under his leadership, anti-Semitism had become mainstream in the party. She later rejoined Labour when Sir Keir Starmer took over, saying she was confident he was someone in whom British Jews could have trust. Louise, welcome. Lovely to see you again. Long time no see. Louise, yes. do you still have that opinion? Do you still trust Keir Starmer? Yes, I do. And I think the Jewish community, as, as well as the British people, have every reason to trust Keir Starmer. He's taken on very difficult situations. He's done what's right. And I think that's one of the reasons that he's now being challenged in his views on, on the tragedy that's unfolding in Israel and Gaza. Now, being leader isn't easy. You have to do what's right. And not everybody likes it. And so I do approve of his overall handling of the conflict so far. And what do you think about the, the, the handling of the government of the conflict? Are we on the right side, do you think, of the arguments on this? Yes, I think the government are, are on the right side. I think it's very important that people recognise that Hamas is a terrorist group. It's committing its atrocities in Israel, but it's linked with Iran and it's ready to commit atrocities elsewhere around the world. And some occasion, indeed, it has already done so. And it's right to declare that Israel has, well, I would say, not just a right, but actually a duty to protect its own citizens. And doing that can become very difficult indeed and involve some very difficult choices and some very tragic situations. So, so Louise, what do you think, talking about Hamas being a terrorist organisation, what, what's your opinion of how the BBC have handled the... The, the war as it's so far, and particularly the attack on the hospital in Gaza? Well, I can see that the BBC doesn't want to admit that Hamas are terrorists, so they, they now use the phrase uh, it's an organisation designated terrorist by governments, including our own, and maybe that's as close as, as they want to get to it. On the issue of the hospital in Gaza, I think the BBC led to the view, as many others did, that something awful has happened so it must be Israel's fault. There was never any evidence for that. And they only started to retreat a bit from that. And evidence that, in, in fact, it was an Islamic jihad shell that had caused the problem. And that's really they seemed quite reluctant to do it. So I think it, it was a lapse. And it was just falling into that trap of always wanting to believe the worst about Israel. Yeah, I agree. So, you know... Louise, the, uh, the Labour Party has come a long way in a very short space of time. When you think back to what it was like, anti-Semitism was, was growing in the party, as you said yourself, and the position the Labour Party was in in 2019, it's just four years ago. And, but Jeremy Corbyn wasn't just one person. There were many people, both in the wider party and in Westminster, who supported his views. Do you think it's possible for Keir Starmer to change the views of the Labour wider party and MPs to such a degree that you can trust the party moving forward. I mean, he is one man and, and he is having, you know, we've got Labour councillors resigning this week. We've got Labour MPs on, on resignation watch who are on the front bench. It hasn't all gone away, has it, Louise? You know, what Jeremy Corbyn fed off, it's still there and the individuals he fed off are still there in the party. Well, they, they will never all go away. I wish they would, but they won't all go away. And the Labour Party's always been a mixture of people. But what happened when Jeremy Corbyn was leader was that the hard left and the people who backed them became dominant in the Labour Party and they became the loudest voice. So we had extremist policies that alienated the British people who could just never be implemented. The party nationally became dominated by anti-Semitism and local Labour parties started to be run by people who were promoting anti-Semitism and drove me out and similar things happened to other people. Now, Keir Starmer hasn't been able to get rid of all of that, but what he has done is to stop those people having any influence. He's changed the culture of the Labour Party and many of those perpetrators have either been expelled or have removed themselves. Yeah, but those that are still there though, Louise, the minute... Keir falls over something. The minute he stumbles, 
they will seize upon that opportunity. They won't now because they think he's stronger, but the minute he's weak, you and I both know, the minute he is weakened, they will dive in and they will still, and, and the test of Keir Starmer will be how he handles it then when he's a weaker leader than he is today. Do you think he should be calling for a ceasefire as the Labour councillors and others are, and Sadiq Khan is asking? No, 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 I don't. If you recognise that Hamas is a terrorist organisation, that Israel suffered a massacre of people on one day, more than any single day since the Holocaust, from an avowedly terrorist organisation that wants to destroy all Jews and destroy anyone who isn't Islamist like them, you have to recognise the need to do something about it. And this isn't just about words. So you can't embark on action to deal with Hamas to try to eliminate or reduce their military infrastructure and then run away when it becomes very difficult. So, no, there shouldn't be a ceasefire. What I think should happen is that some pauses perhaps should be made so that more humanitarian aid can get through to support people on the ground in Gaza. But there has to be that action against the master to dismantle its terrorist infrastructure. And it's just wrong to, to move away and because it's going, it's getting tough, and to say, no, we shouldn't be doing that anymore. Louise, thank you. Um, I've just been thinking while you were talking, when was the first time I was ever in a TV interview with you? And I think it was 25 years ago. So oh. love, lovely to see you. I think it was that we were in the Northwest. And I think I was standing yeah. in Hazel Grove at the time. And I think we were on a, a politics oh. programme. But lovely to see you oh, again, oh, Louise. Oh, yeah. Northwest. That's thank it, you. yeah. So thank I hope you. I'm treating you well and lovely to see you. And thank you for coming on the show. Thank you very much. Right, next, let's speak to counts the councillor for Gelding Borough in Nottinghamshire, Russell Whiting. Now, Russell was one of more than 20 Labour councillors who quit the party across the country over this. Russell, when did you, at what point, what was it that made you think? Because it's a big deal to stand down from a position in the party that you love and you work for. At what point did you think, did the thought hit you, I've got to go? Yeah, hi Nadine. So I've been a member of the Labour Party for about 15 years. Um, stood for local council a few times, got elected in May, as you say, stood for parliament in 2015, have given a lot of blood, sweat, tears and shoe leather to the Labour Party over the years, as we all do to our political parties. I, I was in Liverpool at Labour Party conference a few weeks ago. Uh, a friend came over to me and said, have you seen Keir Starmer's interview on LBC? He played it to me. And I thought that's a shocking thing to have said, um, you know, when he gave support for the siege, the clip you played earlier on. But I thought it's obviously the end of a long week. He's misspoke. He's misheard the question. There'll, there'll be some kind of clarification. Then over the next 48, 72 hours, Emily Thornberry, David Lammy uh, and others sent out to defend that line. And um, that's when I knew that I just couldn't be part of the Labour Party anymore. I, cu I couldn't be part of any organisation where senior people at the top are advocating cutting off water, food, medical supplies to over two million people. So, Russell, what about Egypt? Egypt can get food and water and medical supplies into... Why, why is nobody talking about the role of Egypt, that Egypt can play in this? Well, it needs to... Obviously, the situation in Gaza is so horrible that it needs to be, uh, you know, a region-wide effort. But I think the uh, Gazans, on average, were receiving about 450 trucks of aid a day. And last week, Egypt let 20 through the Rafa crossing. Yeah, but why? Um, but it's also, an Arab why, why state. Would, why? Why would Egypt allow its drivers to go in and put them in harm's way when bombs are raining down left, right and centre in Gaza? Nadine, Israel told the Gazans to move to the south and they've, since that order was given they've been relentlessly bombing places like Khan Yunus in the south killing the very people that they told to move there in order to be safe. This is why we need a ceasefire so that a proper humanitarian operation uh, can carry be carried out not some kind of humanitarian pause to allow people you know a sandwich and a bottle of water before the bombs start raining down again. We need a proper ceasefire so that lives can actually be saved. And part of the reason for those people being moved to the south, they Russell, was so that they could cross through the... And they were asked to go to the Rafa crossing, so those who needed to leave could leave. But again, the Egyptians didn't let them, despite the fact that many people were gathered there, believing that that's the way they could exit with passports. But no, I, I, totally, I totally get where you're coming from on aid to civilians. But 
You know, the absolute reality is that, you know, Hamas crossed that border into Israel and with their bare hands murdered 1,300 people. It wasn't targeted bombing, not of civilians, but of known Hamas, where Hamas are, are gathered and the, 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 the targets that they need to get to destroy Hamas. Hamas crossed and with their bare hands tore open the stomach of a woman, took out her baby, beheaded it and then beheaded her. These were absolute cold-blooded evil murders, 1,300 of them, that took place within five hours. Now, I... As, as somebody who is pro the Palestinian people and pro Israel, not pro Hamas, understand the right of Israel to defend itself, to rid, rid the world of the evil that is Hamas. And sadly, in every war, Second World War, Iraq, or wherever you look, Afghanistan, often civilians are the consequence of the actions. And in this case, they are the consequence of the actions of Hamas. Do you have any, do you acknowledge that? Do you, do you agree with that? Of course, that? yeah. Look, I, I, I remember, what, three weeks ago, waking up on that Saturday morning and, and switching on my phone. And the first thing seeing on my phone was the, the kind of the first stories emerging. And my first thoughts, of course, were the absolute horror that was unfolding. And I've got two young kids myself. Uh, you know, you don't have to have children to be aware of these things. You just have to be a human being to be aware that these are the most appalling acts that were carried out in Israel. And, and of course, Israel has a right to defend itself. And of course, I think, you know, all reasonable people think that terrorists need to be tackled and, and need to be rooted out. But you mentioned Afghanistan there, Nadine. Britain and America and, and others spent 20 years bombing the Taliban in America because, and Afghanistan, sorry, because we thought that we could bomb terrorism uh, out of existence in Afghanistan. And, and what happened in the end? You know, we kind of hightailed it and the Taliban are back and bigger than ever. Um, you cannot and bomb terrorism that's a tragedy. Out. That is the biggest child's tragedy of the Biden administration. Cannot bomb terrorism out of existence, can you? Uh, our, own, our own lessons here in the UK with the IRA, we did not bomb uh, Belfast out of existence or try to because of you know, the Birmingham bomb well, or Russell, any... Russell, Russell, can I just say, I don't think you can compare the two and you can't compare Gaza with, with Afghanistan, just even geographically and in numbers, you can't compare the two. I just want to ask you one quick question, but they have to go, I know I'm going over time. So, Russell, do you think you acted in haste? I say that as somebody who resigned herself recently. Do you think you may have acted in haste? Do you wish now that you just thought a little bit longer? No, not at all. I have zero regrets. I, the reason that I resigned is because I was having sleepless nights over whether I could still be part of this Labour Party. The reason I resigned is that in the future, you know, when my children ask me about this conflict, at least I will be able to say that I spoke out and I stood up for those people in Gaza when they needed us most. Well, Russell, there are very few people like you who have a heart and principles in politics. I wish you'd stayed, even though you would be on the opposite side of the political divide to me. But good luck with the future, and I hope you go back to politics one day. So, Thanks, coming up, Israel vows to teach you and a lesson in response to comments made by the Secretary General Antonio Guterres. But is, it reaction, is its reaction justified? I'll get the views of the former UK ambassador to the UN, Mark Lyle Grant.
This is Talk TV. Welcome back to Friday Night with Nadine. The horrifying atrocities of October the 7th rocked Israel to its very core, and its response has been unrelenting. Throughout, world leaders have been treading carefully when discussing the conflict. The same cannot be said for the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who has triggered outrage this week with these comments. It is important to also recognize the attacks by Hamas did not happen in a vacuum. The Palestinian people have been subjected to 56 years of suffocating occupation. Now, the Israeli ambassador to the UN is calling for terrorists to go, and Israel has started refusing visas for UN officials. Tonight, we ask, is this wise? Doesn't Israel need the UN now more than ever? To discuss with me, this with me is the former UK ambassador to the UN, Mark Lyle Grant. Good evening, Nadine. And good evening to you, and welcome. So what do you make of all this? Well, I think you took that clip slightly out of context, to be fair to Antonio Guterres, because he made very clear that he condemned the atrocities committed by Hamas and said in terms that no Palestinian grievances justified such acts of terrorism. But he did go on to say, as you uh, rightly uh, mentioned, that this didn't appear in a vacuum, which, to be honest, is a statement of the obvious. So to me, this wasn't a particularly shocking statement. Um, the most controversial thing he said in that speech for me was calling for a ceasefire, because a ceasefire is clearly at this point of beneficial uh, benefit to Hamas and disadvantageous to the Israelis uh, militarily. But otherwise, I think his, his speech was actually quite balanced. And it's unwise of Israel really to uh, make an enemy of the UN by calling for his resignation. So that's what I'm going to come on to. So how important is it that, because what, what we're witnessing is the breakdown of a, a very significant relationship, how important is U, the UN to Israel? Well, to be fair, the, Israel has never liked the UN. It's always felt that the majority of countries are biased against Israel and that they don't get a fear. And is that true? Are, are they yes, justified it is, in that? largely, because the UN spends a lot of time talking about the Israel-Palestine issue. When I was there, it was, you know, on the agenda practically every week in the UN Security Council. And the vast majority of UN members do not like Israel and they support the Palestinian cause for an independent state. And it is Israel, in their eyes, that is preventing that. And why is that? that? Why do they do that? Well, because I think they feel that Israel... Is, is... it just the number of Arab nations? That no, no, no. We're nations? talking... I mean, there'll be a vote in the UN General Assembly today, uh, later this evening, at which I would expect maybe 130 countries will vote in favour of the Palestinians, calling for a ceasefire... Um, and saying that the suffering of the Palestinian children and well, women then, needs to stop. Well, then, in that case, Mark, is the UN past its sell-by date, then? Is it actually a, a force for good if we have a block of countries on the UN that, as you say in your own words, are so anti-Israel? Yeah, but this is a block of countries in the world. I mean, every member of the UN, you know, every country in the world is a member of the United yeah, Nations. Yeah, but it can't, carry out, it, it can't carry out unbiased that, functions, can it? No, bear in mind, it's not like the European Union. The UN is an intergovernmental body. So the UN does not have any supranational powers. So the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, may be head of the, the UN, but he's not nearly as powerful as the President of the U EU Commission, for instance. So he is more Secretary than General, as they say. So he has to reflect the majority of the member states. And by reflecting the majority of the member states, he has to say that he understands what the Palestinians have suffered over the last 50 years. And that's what he said And does he speech. also have to say, understand what Israel has suffered? And he did. And he did do so in that speech. But it has caused a furore. It has. And I say, I think it's unwise because Israel needs friends right now. Not necessarily the UN as a system, but they don't have many friends around the world. And they can't afford to alienate more people. You've seen what the president of Turkey said recently. You've seen what the uh, Mohammed bin Salman Portugal in in Saudi Arabia has said. These are countries that were normalizing their relations with Israel, now distancing themselves. So I think it's unwise of Israel to say, we're not going to give visas to any UN officials. Guterres should resign. They need friends right now. I, well, I think one can also understand the, the reaction of Israel. And I've just said in my previous clip with um, Russell Whiting that, you know, that Hamas broke across the border and with their hands murdered 
brutally murdered and attacked 1,300 civilians in Israel. Absolutely. The response of that, this wasn't a bomb being dropped on a specific target within conventions. This was, you know, this was, this was Hamas going over, ripping open a woman's stomach, taking out her baby, beheading it in front of her, then beheading her. And it's, you know, it, the, the reaction, the emotional reaction of a government, I think, to the to the emotional hurt being suffered by its people, it's not normal, even in terms of war and no, conflict. No, absolutely, a hundred percent understand that. But Netanyahu should listen to Joe Biden. What did Joe Biden say? Don't make the mistakes that we made after 9/11. Taking big strategic policy decisions in the white heat of anger. Of mm. course, all the Israeli people, and that's they want sense. to wipe out uh, Hamas. Yeah. And Israel has absolutely the right to destroy Hamas as a military organization. And how the, but how they go about it is important, Nadine. Mm. They need to do it within the confines of international humanitarian law. And if they don't, they will lose even more support, and even in Europe. I totally agree with you. Matthew, what do you think? I think he chose his words poorly because by saying that these atrocities, and they were medieval in their savagery, didn't happen in a vacuum, somehow enables Israel to, to, to say that he's linking these atrocities to Israel's behaviour. And therefore, I think he chose his words undiplomatically. That said... Which is a strange, the Secretary General of the UN. Well, I think it's poor. <laughs> that said, I don't think it is in, in, in Israel's interests to be attacking the United Nations. It is, in my view now, losing the PR war very significantly. What we saw on October the 7th was perhaps unprecedented in its barbarity, truly unimaginably horrific for any of us as human beings, whatever so-called side anyone might find themselves on. Had Israel paused, as you say, in the white heat of that rage, and instead of bombing Gaza to bits, reflected, reflected on Joe Biden's words. And Biden's words were humble words. We have made terrible mistakes ourselves in the West. And had it paused and worked out what actually was in its own strategic interests, as well as in the interests of a humanitarianism. Difficult it's difficult, do, Matthew, it's difficult, but it's a state, Nadine. But it is a state, it is a state suffering deep trauma. Of course, it's, I have friends who live in Tel Aviv, but just because you are in deep trauma, doesn't entitle you to challenge the rules of war. And unfortunately, I think that's what's happening. And as a consequence of that, it is making life for Israel more difficult, it's making life for the region more difficult. And Palestinian children, who are every bit as valuable as Israeli children, are now also losing their lives in horrific numbers. Madeleine, what's I, your take on I this? would just say that I'm not really... I don't think the UN has, has been a very good friend to Israel ever in its life. I mean, it has a tendency to disproportionately issue resolutions against Israel far, far more than countries that are objectively far greater offenders of, of human rights. So I think that Israel, as it, as it stands now, is, is facing an attack from Hamas, a, an organisation that although it doesn't have the, the wherewithal to do this, has fully genocidal intentions and can, as we have seen, cause the most devastating loss of life. I think that they will probably, although no doubt there are many people who are angered by the words of, of, of the UN and indeed by commentators in Western countries saying we want a ceasefire now, they will probably look to themselves and to the security of their people and basically ignore a lot of this stuff. Although I very much agree uh, with, 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 with everyone else on the panel that, you know, there is a real, that Israel does need friends and that the PR war is something that, that cannot be taken lightly. However, I, I think that, you know, coming from these quarters, we're not, th these weren't necessarily the biggest allies of Israel to, to begin with. They need to be more concerned about what Joe Biden said than what the UN said, frankly. That's that, I agree. Mark, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I, I think it's, we've gone to a position of um, where the, the humanitarian aspect of this and the reality has collided with the emotion. It's uh, that white heat moment. It's people running the government. It's people making the decisions. It's people who've got families and friends mm. who were possibly murdered in that conflict. I think it's very, a very difficult situation to, for Biden to use his words, but for those words to be heeded and for those words to be taken on board fully. Three months from now, we may be in a different place or six months when some of the rage and the hurt has subsided. But at the moment, I think But it's... by then, so many more Palestinian yeah. children will be dead. I know, I know. I Israel know. may have completely lost the PR war in the next few days if 
the ground invasion, which I'm sure will happen, it has to happen if they're going to destroy Hamas as a, mm. a military capability, but if they do that in the wrong way and many more thousands of civilians are killed in, in Gaza... But, of course, then Mark, they we are have going to, to make the isolated. point that Hamas use those civilians as their shields. Absolutely. And they, 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 they position themselves within those communities in order that they think they're protected by those human shields. So, coming up... Thank you, Mark. Coming up, is there any way back for the BBC after its repeated failure to brand Hamas as terrorists? Its Director General faced MPs this week who said they've never been so disappointed. We're here! Good morning, everybody! I hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening. I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored, in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. <laughs> ah! Me and you conquer time. Who wins? Happens. You. <laughs> do you know what I love about Talk today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for Rishi Sunak? I'm so <laughs> rich. But, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous... What, do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis No, I am not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted new. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's that almost that like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. The first thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> there's a threat that you'd be worried about. So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. The one thing Labour would be terrified of if Boris Johnson zoomed back into full focus. Boris Johnson uh, isn't what he was. Most of them seem to have given up. Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, yes, solved. Please. Yeah. Problem solved. He's as up. fit as a butcher's dog. There he's, you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog? Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. No, I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know, now you're probably going to boot me off the show after saying this <laughs> girl. But <laughs> I say, I'm not, I'm not a Swifty. Critics, I'd say me included, <laughs> got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, yeah. <laughs> Great first show, you having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man, you know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. Well, I'd rather do it on camera. No. no, 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 no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you had? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. It was a fabulous dinner until <laughs> you two uh, mooned us. <laughs> Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Welcome back to Friday Night with Nadine. The latest blow to the reputation of the BBC is continued refusal to brand Hamas as terrorists. Director General Tim Davey was confronted on the issue during a behind closed doors meeting between himself and the 1922 Committee of Conservative MPs on Wednesday. Immigration Minister Robert Jenrick saying he had never been so disappointed in the corporation as he had over its coverage of Israel. But Mr Davey remained firm, defending the existing BBC policy, which is to state that Hamas has been prescribed as a terror group by the UK government. However, according to Tory MPs, he did accept that some mistakes were made in the coverage of the Gaza hospital explosion. But with viewers losing faith in the corporation, how can the BBC revive its reputation? So joining me in the studio is a media correspondent for The Times, Alex Farber. Alex, so as a media correspondent, as someone who asks me about the BBC every now and then, so 
Why is it that the BBC are being so stubborn on describing Hamas as terrorists? Well, the BBC has said quite clearly, Nadine, that it doesn't think that calling Hamas terrorists is particularly helpful. They don't think that that language helps it to... Hang on, let me stop you there. Mm -hmm. Why would it be unhelpful? I think they feel that it would um, perhaps compromise their role for impartiality. Oh, and... well, stop you there again. Oh, every other broadcaster's doing it. I'm not sure that that's true, that every other broadcaster is routinely describing Hamas as terrorists. And I think it's worth pointing out that the BBC is allowing guests and commentators to describe them as such. It doesn't ban words, and it hasn't banned the word terrorists. But, you know, you may not... People may not agree with them, and there's plenty of people that disagree and that consider you're completely in the right, Nadine, and, and think that they should be calling Hamas out for what they consider them to be, terrorists. But the BBC's position is that's not the kind of language that it feels is helpful um, in a very polarised debate. So I don't buy that, you see, because the BBC has got itself into a right mess and there are, as you... The vast majority of people agree with me, I'm very sure, although I don't have figures, but from what you can see and what you can read, that's the vast majority... It's just baffling to so many people, this refusal. Now... I, I, I saw something by Andrew Neil this week which said that actually there is an issue now for those journalists, BBC journalists who are reporting from Israel, where there is this... You know, it's not... They're not, they're not reporting on the war in a vacuum in the UK. People in Israel, as in times of conflict or crisis, people turn to the BBC. And I saw a disturbing interview this week where somebody in Israel was very angry with the BBC that actually, when you say they need this neutrality, they're now in a position where their reporters in Israel are in a very difficult position for not describing Hamas as terrorists. And I think it's they've shot themselves in the foot. There in no way is this balance tipping in the BBC's direction. And the reasons you say, I just don't think, are robust enough to keep maintaining the position they are. Now, a former employee of the BBC said, said that there was this fault line running through the BBC, which is incredibly problematic, and political. Is that where the root of this lies? Is it political? I mean, there's always politics involved with the BBC, as you know, as a former culture secretary. I mean, you... The BBC, for its part, can says that it has received an equal number of complaints from those that consider it to be too um, lenient on Israel. And do you believe that? You have to take what they're saying regards their complaints at face value. I don't think they would make these things up. Um, equally... I completely understand there's people in Israel very upset about the tone of the coverage, and it is important. They've said that it's in coverage. One could argue there's other journalists operating in Gaza, speaking to Palestinian people, and were they to describe them in that way, that would be problematic for them. The problem the BBC has is it's a very big organisation with plenty of people from either side of the debate looking to it to take a position. And not only does it have to try and manage... Um, audiences, it also has to manage its own employees. People feel very strongly about this, both the BBC's journalists internally and audiences externally, and they are trying their best to navigate that. And one could argue that they are failing to please either side. Madeline, only just two quick comments in the pan, Madeline. What, the BBC, are they just on a highway to nothing here? Are they eventually going to have to give in? I think that they've, it's just gone so far because it's so obvious the inconsistencies that they've been applying. They find, they've had no trouble describing Islamic State as terrorists or the IRA as terrorists, and there are loads of other examples that people have dug out. And the fact that they are digging their heels in on this one issue has led many people in Britain, many British Jews, to feel that this, this relates to double standards and, you know, all sorts of concerns on that front. And, of course, on the ground, there are, there are issues where... BBC, amongst other broadcasters, have been guilty of quoting things from Palestinian officials at face value, Palestinian officials obviously being Hamas and taking their lines at face value. So I think it is coming to a head and it's creating a great deal of anger in Israel, but also in, here in Britain. So, I'm Jewish. That's been very quick. I'm Jewish. I have a huge concern. Oh, I didn't mean I, I a huge concern about the rise in anti-Semitism that we're witnessing in Britain at the moment and have great solidarity with fellow Jews around the country who feel fear. I don't personally, but I, I understand why they do. I worked for the BBC for nine years. I don't think this comes from a bad place. I don't think they're deliberately trying to antagonise Jewish people or indeed Israel. 
but I think they've got it wrong. And the reason I think I've got, they've got it wrong is because Hamas is a prescribed terrorist organisation in this country. The BBC is the British Broadcasting Corporation. And also, and most importantly, you've got to call a terrorist a terrorist. And when someone butchers a child or rapes a child or does unspeakable things in the name of a political cause, that, for me, is terrorism very, very straightforwardly. Well, that's very clear. Thank you. And thank you very much, Alex, for coming on. That brings us to the end of tonight's show. Thank you for joining me. Thank you to Alex in the studio. And thank you to my panel, Madeline and Matthew. I'm back at 8pm next week. Good night for now. <laughs>